Hi everyone, it's Anand here. So if you're watching this video, you click through because you already know a little bit about pensions and ISAs, right? Great, I'll whiz through those super quick and then I'll delve deeper into the less talked about parts of both before giving you some insight into what I prioritize and why. Let's jump right in. So here's the basics. ISAs are individual savings accounts. They're effectively accounts with a tax wrapper around them, be it a cash ISA, a stock and shares ISA, or an innovative finance ISA. You contribute to them with after-tax money, i.e. money that you've earned that has already been subject to tax. With ISAs, there are no further taxes to pay ever. Once you've put the money in, it grows tax-free. When you come to withdraw from it, if you ever want to, there's no further taxes to pay. The money you have in an ISA, it is effectively accessible at any time. If you decide you need some of it, you can get to it without much effort. Beware though, the moment you withdraw any money from an ISA, you lose the taxable advantage that it gives you. So for example, if you needed to withdraw 1,000 pounds from your ISA, you can do that. If you try and put another 1,000 pounds in, it will count towards this year's allowance. And as ISAs are simple accounts just with a tax wrapper around it, they do form part of your estate and is subject to inheritance tax. Now pensions. You contribute towards pensions with pre-tax income. You are effectively redirecting your income before it becomes subject to tax into a pension pot. The government then also contributes into your pension, which is where the tax relief benefit comes from. Employers can also contribute into your pension. And if you've got your own limited company, that company can also put money into your pension pot. The money that goes into your pension cannot be accessed until you reach what is known as the normal minimum pension age. Pensions also legally do not form part of your estate and therefore are not subject to inheritance tax in the same way that ISAs are. When it comes to withdrawing from a pension, then any drawdowns are subject to tax to differing degrees, which I'll talk a bit about later. Two more things which I consider basics as well. Whilst money remains in an ISA or in a pension, any profit, capital gains, dividends, growth or interest that occurs within both an ISA and a pension is tax-free. And because of their tax-free nature, the compounding effect is that much greater. Of course, pensions benefit from even greater compounding because of the tax relief at the beginning. So now that's the basics out of the way. I've been in your position. In around 2005, 2006, I sat there looking at my options for long-term investing. At the time, I had a small final salary pension scheme in the background, as well as a defined contribution pension scheme. But I was more concerned with the future. How am I going to plan for my family's long-term financial security? And what financial products should I choose to maximize long-term growth? Obviously, high interest savings accounts was the minimum, but those were a lazy option at best and a wealth destroying option at worst. Then there were a myriad of investment options and peer to peer lending products like Zopa had just been rearing their head, promising headline rates far higher than the high interest savings accounts I mentioned earlier. Innovative finance ISAs hadn't yet been invented. But like everyone else, I was also considering the tax benefits of ISAs and pensions. But I wanted to go beyond the headlines and the basics we've just run through. So I looked into them further. With ISAs, it felt like the more I looked into them, the simpler they got. At the risk of repeating myself, they are simply accounts into which you put cash, stocks and shares, or you do some innovative finance stuff with them. There's not a lot more to it than that. The key benefit, of course, is that ISAs are extremely flexible. You can access your money at any time. And yes, I know you can get fixed term ISAs as well, but you can typically still access your money. You just lose the interest accrued up until that point. With pensions, however, it's a different story. Pensions are locked away until you reach your normal minimum pension age. And the reason I didn't mention the specific age before is because it's changed since it was first put in place and it's about to change again. When the normal minimum pension age was first introduced, the age was set at 50 years old. It's now 55 and in 2027, the age moves to 57. Do you see which direction it's going in? What this tells me is that the government gets to choose what age I get to access my pension. And don't confuse the normal minimum pension age with the state pension age. Those are two different things. At the moment, you don't get to access your state pension until much later. Now, whilst I wouldn't necessarily consider pensions a complex financial product, when it comes to ISAs versus pensions, ISAs are clearly simpler to understand and to manage, both at the beginning and at the end, i.e. at contribution stage and at withdrawal stage. What makes me nervous about pensions is the lack of control you have. You are at the whim of the government of the day in terms of how much you can put into it overall, in terms of what taxes apply when it comes to drawdown, and when you can start your drawdowns or withdrawals at all. I've seen others compare ISAs and pensions, but almost all of them don't consider the following. Number one, some ignore inflation completely. And so the fact that purchasing power is reduced over time due to inflation isn't even considered. Now you might say that inflation is actually negligible, and complicates matters if you're comparing ISAs and pensions, but it can have a dramatic impact over a long period of time. Picture this, it's 30 years ago and you're planning for your financial future. You wanna retire in 30 years time and estimate that 25,000 pounds a year is the amount you'll aim for as an annual income in your elder years. And you pick 25,000 pounds a year because you know the purchasing power that 25,000 pound has when you make that decision. Fast forward 30 years and to match the 25,000 pounds of purchasing power you had 30 years ago, 
today's number would be a little over £51,000, or more than double what you thought it would be. Number two, many assume the same levels of tax as we see today when they apply it to how much you will pay tax on any withdrawals you make from your pension. Now I see this as a massive leap of faith given we're talking about a 30 plus years, maybe even 40 plus years time horizon. Let me show you why. 40 years ago in the UK, the basic rate of tax was 30%. The higher rate of tax was 60%. 10 years prior to that, the basic rate was 33%. The higher rate was 83%. Now I'm not making any predictions about what income tax rates will look like decades from now, but at the same time, I'm not naive enough to think or assume that they will be the same as they are today. But we know people are living longer. We know the costs for health and social care are going up. We also know that the cost of living is increasing at a dramatic pace. So I think it's crazy to assume that the tax rates will be the same as they are today, particularly if that's what all your comparisons are based on. Number three, they all assume a relatively low level of withdrawal from your pension in your elder years. Now, as I've just explained, inflation plays a part here. We are also all living longer and we hear all the time that we are likely to be working for far longer than people you see today, which then means that your earned income and your pension income together will be considered when determining your tax bracket, making it more likely that when it comes to withdrawing your pension, you'll be subject to a higher rate of income tax. And number four, I've seen some videos where comparisons are done between ISIS and pensions, but only in terms of the total pot that is available to you at various ages. The problem I have with this is that for ISIS, yes, that's the pot and that's the amount you get to withdraw. For pensions, it's not the same thing. The size of your pot only tells you half the story because as we've been talking about, pension withdrawals are subject to income tax. So when I see this, I know we're not comparing apples with apples. There are also a number of different ways you can withdraw from a pension. Some of these options can't be changed once you've made the initial selection, so it's important to understand each before making a choice. I also want to touch on inheritance tax because that plays a part here. Now, as I said earlier, ISIS form part of your estate, so like everything else with ISIS, it's fairly simple. It forms part of your estate, that's it. With pensions, it's a little bit different because legally your pension pot does not form part of your estate. It doesn't typically get distributed according to the wishes of your will you need to contact each of your pension providers, assuming there's more than one, and fill in an expression of wishes form so that your pension provider knows who you intend your pension pot to go to, who your beneficiaries are, if you die. But again, there are things to consider here because not everything is equal. If you had chosen an annuity, for example, which is a guaranteed income for life option, which depends on how much you've got in your pension pot, then effectively, when your life ends, so does your annuity. And even if you don't choose an annuity, and you go for a drawdown lump sum or a mixture of the two, then whilst inheritance tax doesn't apply, income tax can apply. Not your income tax, but the income tax rates of your beneficiaries. If you die before the age of 75, then your beneficiaries can withdraw from your pension pot without payment of any further tax and without consideration of their personal tax arrangements. However, if you die after the age of 75, whatever money is left in your pension pot, your beneficiaries can withdraw from it, but any withdrawals are subject to their prevailing rate of income tax at the time. So, so that's another reason why a like-for-like -like comparison doesn't really work because it depends on which options you choose when you die, the prevailing rate of income tax at the time for you and your beneficiaries, the, the age at which you can access your pension, and a myriad of other things, some of which are in your control, some of which are not. Aside from the lack of control, the thing that makes ISIS a preference for me is that they are never subject to any other tax for me again, whereas pensions are subject to the prevailing rate of income tax at the time of withdrawal. And I'll show you a quick example of why I think this is such an important thing to consider. For comparison purposes, we're going to assume a £40,000 investment into your ISA. As you contribute into an ISA with post-tax money, there is no further tax relief to be added, so your total contribution is £40,000 you can see that your contribution into a pension is also £40,000. Now, assuming you're a basic rate taxpayer, that means the government will top up your pension with a further £8,000, making your total contribution £48,000. If you are a higher rate taxpayer, that tax relief would be £18,000, so your total would then be £58,000. We've got to make a few assumptions here for calculation purposes. So let's assume we're investing for 30 years and we're going to be achieving an 8% average annual growth over that term. And so for an ISA, that £40,000 initial investment ends up being £437,000. For a basic rate taxpayer, that pension contribution of £40,000, which totals 48 with tax relief, ends up being £524,000, a little shy of 525 actually. And for a higher rate taxpayer, it's £634,000. 30 years later, you're thinking about drawing down that money. For an ISA, again, very simple. £437,000 is what you've got in the ISA, and therefore that's the exact amount you've got available for drawdown. Now for the pension that attracted a basic rate tax relief at the beginning. The total drawdown there after the tax you pay 
is £446,000 because you've got a 25% tax-free amount of 131000 Assuming, of course, that a 25% tax-free amount stays 30 years later, the tax you pay on the rest is about 78000 making the remainder 314 totaling £446,000. Now, for the pension that attracted a higher rate tax relief, it's obviously going to be higher, and you can see the numbers there on screen. The total drawdown will be £539,000. Putting them side by side, you can see the difference. Clearly, the pension that attracted a higher rate tax relief is the winner. But this assumes that a basic rate of tax of 20% will be applied on drawdowns in 30 years' time. Let's see what happens if that tax rate went up by just 5% i.e. 25% instead of the 20. So as you can see, the ISA hasn't moved, but the pensions clearly have. What would it look like if it was 30% and 35%? From the numbers there, it's clear the ISA doesn't change for obvious reasons, and the pension rates do because they attract income tax at the, at the drawdown stage. Again, the point I'm making here is that for pensions, the amount you get to withdraw when you get to withdraw it is out of your control, whereas an ISA is within your control. And for me, the differences aren't large enough for me to take a risk on pensions over the long term. Now, with all that said, it isn't really a showdown between ISAs or pensions. It isn't just a single choice issue. You can have ISAs and pensions. I myself have ISAs and pensions, but I do prioritize filling my ISA up to the max before I consider contributing into my pension. Only when I've completely maxed out my ISA allowance for the year will I contribute anything to a pension. Near the start of the video, I mentioned I had a final salary pension scheme and another contribution-based pension scheme around at the time. I've since put those all together. I withdrew the money from my final salary pension scheme, put it together with my contribution-based one, and it all sits in one pension account, one SIP within Vanguard. And within that SIP, I have an all-weather fund approach to maximize my long-term returns. For ISAs, I use a high-interest cash ISA for my emergency funds account, but everything else goes into a stock and shares ISA, again in an all-weather fund portfolio, similar to my pension. I hope you found that useful, but now it's over to you. Which one do you prioritize, an ISA or a pension? Have you got any questions or think I might have missed something? Please let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you. Until then, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and I'll see you next time.